Okay, so um, what, what I intend to do this week is, is almost a kind of Cook's tour of different examples of using charts, diagrams and so on. But I thought I'd start with a few comments about why one should use them and what, what use they are. So that's the, the first slide. Just some of the ideas that kind of might be used. And I, I'll say as I go through which of the slide, which of the um, diagrams and images and so on can be used in a way. But first of all, and this will be what we do exercise on later on, it can, they can be used in clarifying the situation during the dissertation. So when you're talking to respondents, you can sit with them drawing a chart or draw a chart as you ask them questions. It's a way of reminding you what, what you don't know and what to fill in and so on. Um, and that's something you mentioned taxonomy earlier on, that's the kind of things where you might you know, share it with the respondents as to, to, to what's going on in the organisation or the setting or whatever you, you look at. Secondly, you can use them in a much more creative fashion as part of your analysis process uh, when you try to construct models. And you, you've seen from previous weeks, I've had various images and diagrams of models that people have constructed. Well, you too can construct things that way. And you can do it in the software as well if you're using the software. But often just pencil and paper is good enough for thinking through ideas. It's, a, it's a ways of being creative about the thinking about the ideas. So I'll, I'll show you one of those. You can use them to illustrate um, examples of your own arguments, and of course the, these models themselves might appear in your final documents as examples of what you've done for the published versions of them at least. Um, but the tables and, and things can illustrate things for the reader, so you can actually use them in your final report, some of these tables. Some are not meant like that, some are meant as, as procedural things, as part of the analysis, but some big can become summaries to use in reports. What I would say about that is, I, I personally, find it quite difficult to work with diagrams if they're not explained properly. And I think diagrams help understand something, but they rarely, very rarely stand on their own without explanation when you're writing up, that is. I mean, a different purpose when you're using it for analysis, but when you're writing up, I think you need to explain what's going on as well as use a diagram. The two together can be very, very useful indeed, but having a diagram that doesn't have sufficient explanation, I think is a mistake. And, and very often you find that in, in, in people's um, writings. And the, the, another use for, for tables, as I'll show you later on, is to, to lay out the data in a certain kind of standardised fashion so that you can then use it or use that layout to discover patterns. And that's particularly some of the tables I'll look at are, are useful in that kind of sense. Um, I've got small copies in here on the, the sheet to, to, to show you. But actually, when you're doing it, you might want to use the whole wall to put up a large table with lots of quotations and so on. So. And lastly, it's a form of data reduction. You know, one of the things that you do in analysis is try to data reduce to, to get things in a more coherent and more concise um, uh, layout, which you can then use to either to do your own analysis or your own thinking or to show others what you found. Okay, so that, those are the kind of uses for, for diagrams and for tables. Let me look at some examples of what these are. I want to start with something that's quite anthropological. This is the kind of thing you expect ethnographers to do when they're in strange situations and subcultures and societies and so on. It's to, to find out what people's conceptions are, to find out how they see the world. And domain analysis is an examination of what some term or concept means for a group or subgroup. And there are various ways you can express that visually in the diagrams and so on. And one of those ways is the taxonomy. Particularly if people organise things in their experience in a certain kind of way, you can talk to them about how they're doing it. And a diagram, a taxonomic diagram, can often clarify or help what they're doing there. So it captures the relationships between objects in the subculture or in the society you're examining. And often a taxonomy, taxonomy rather, is hierarchical. It has these children. So this is the there's a terminology I borrow from, from in Vigo, I think. You have parents and chil children in, in the tree, so a parent has various children. Children have one, one parent. Um, and in a taxonomy, the, the subtypes are usually mutually exclusive, a bit like um, species and, and uh, in, in the, the kind of natural taxonomy. And I'll give you an example of that on the next um, slide. This is... Um, taken from a certain project about, I was involved in some years ago, about um, the unemployed and looking for work. So here, just going through the whole data set, I kind of tried to produce a taxonomy of how they got help and how they looked for help and so on. And you can see, first of all, I divided up the employment help into get information, 
um, getting formal assistance and getting informal assistance. So I've got three major things. So in this diagram, there's, there's one parent which has three children, and then those themselves have children. So the information has the TAP, which I can't remember the sense, or an access point, technology access point, something like that. It's sort of, sort of, it's a kind of it's all in, kind of uh, I mean, these days be done by the web, but this was ten years ago, so the pre-web access into the, the, the jobs and information. Newspapers and library. The formal system employment and a whole set of formal systems that were set up across the local authority and across national systems. So careers guidance, training and help, counselling help, help with setting up businesses and other general kinds of, of assistance. And then the informal ways that people look for work uh, through you know, uh, job clubs and networks, including word of mouth and so on. So you can see it's a way of arranging things. Now, this is something you might use, you might build this up during your research and gradually add to it as you come across new things and people mention things, oh, that's interesting, I haven't come across that before. Where does that fit in? Is it one of these or one of those or one of those and so on? And gradually build up a diagram and you begin to get a, a much clearer picture of, of, of what the, um, in this case, what the, the actual um, forms of assistance for, for the system. Well, Yes. That's right. It's coding. It is coding. These, you, these could be codes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's hierarchical in the same way. So Enviva has a hierarchical coding system. Yes, it is. It could cool be that. I'll give you another example on the next page. Um, this is taken. Oh, I should mention this point that a lot of the ideas in this session come from the book by Miles and Huberman. Um, about qualitative data analysis, and in fact, the reference at the bottom here is their book. So the book's called Qualitative Data Analysis: A Source Book of New Methods. Not so new these days. The book was published in 1994, <laughs> so it's 16 years old, um, but still full of it. So it's a really thick, large format book, in the same size as a sheet of paper, um, and um, it has lots and lots of ideas in it, both about coding and about the use of diagrams and all kinds of things as well. Um, which are still worth, worth um, having a, a flick through and, and, and using. And this is one they give of Jack's Folk Taxonomy of Cars and Trucks, and obviously some piece of research by Bernard in 1994. How the particular respondent called Jack arranges his, uh, his conceptions of what cars are. He's obviously into cars, as you can see from the kind of detail in it. But this is how he thinks of cars and how he classifies them. And so again, you might use this kind of way of laying out things as a way of eliciting from people how they think of these kinds of concepts and how they divide up the world, in that sense, in, in their minds. Another aspect of this kind of work, domain analysis, is componential analysis, looking at components of things and what attributes does an individual or a, a, a phenomenon have. Um, and I'll give an example here, again from the, the unemployment project, of various kinds of services that there were. So this comes off the previous diagram, these are the services, oh, I'm training, we're training. Oh, the training, TAP, is training access points, work week, ECT, and so on. Um, and in this case, just a quick plus or minus sign to indicate for each one whether they're meant for the young, for older, whether they get training, whether they get advice, or you know, all sorts of things. So some, for example, training access points both for young and for older uh, people, and they can advise but not training. And so, so you can see, you know, this is nothing terribly spectacular, but it's a way of laying out a bit of the information. And it might be this is something which you puzzle about. And it, the usefulness of having diagrams like this is it, it, you, you can see the gaps. You might find there's a whole bit of fear that you haven't got anything in at all because you don't know. In which case, you, you know that you don't know. So it's a way of finding out what's missing from you or of fitting things in to, to, to a schema to know, for example, that you know, both training access points, work link, and the CETA all aim at all ages, along with the CIASA, um, but other things don't. I mean, either because they're named like career service and they for that or use training and so on. So it's ways of making distinctions. So uh, I suppose the usefulness here is a way of laying things out in, in a, a neat form that you can then begin to understand. While we're on that idea, I mean, the matrix is, is the next thing I want to talk about. Um, matrix, sometimes, I, mean, I think I use the term matrix here because that's the term that Enviva uses. 
and, and they produce matrices. Actually, tables is not only putting it. I think probably we're talking about tables now. That's what we're doing here. So laying out data, data in tables, a bit like cross tabulations. Except in cross tabulations, of course, each individual unit only appears in one cell. It can't appear in more than one cell. In qualitative work using text, that doesn't matter so much. Um, the rows and columns, of course, matter to us, and they can be a variety of things. But what's in a particular cell is not a single you know, count of something. It's not numbers, but rather it's, it's usually text. It's usually something that somebody said, or some observation that you've made, that you put in there. Um, rows and columns can be various things, and they can be codes, of course. They can be attributes, you know, whether the person's male, female, old, young, living in Yorkshire, living in Lancashire, whatever, those kind of things. Um, and it can be things like time, you know, whether it's the first, second, third visit, or you know, one year, two years, three years, and those kind of differences as well. We'll see various examples of those in a moment. I put up here a quotation, or rather a reference to a text which is very good on this area. Uh, Ritchie and Lewis um, have a book called Quantitative Research Practice, in which they talk about their approach um, which they call framework analysis. They call it framework analysis. Um, and what they do, along with the coding and so on, of the kind that we've come across many times, um, they also use these tables in various ways. And their, their book shows very clearly how, how they think they should be used. I think, I think there are various ways, in addition to what they talk about, that they can be used, as you'll see. But certainly they do talk about using them in quite a structured kind of fashion. So here's some examples of that. Um, I thought I'd start with a very simple example, and this is a kind of made up thing, um, to show you what's involved here. Um, that, and, and by the way, I've, I've labelled the cells, cells one, two, 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 and so on, um, rows and columns, so cell, you know, row one, column two, and that's what that means. You don't normally put those in, you don't need to do it. I put them in there so they can refer to them, basically. Mm -hmm. But you don't, just like I say that now, that those things don't need to be in any tables you do. But if you're going to use it to refer to it, perhaps in what you write up, then it's sometimes useful to, to actually name the cells. Although, of course, you can simply say the male non-science degree cell, if I identify it by the, the rows and columns headers. So here's a simple two by two table. And what I've shown here is that kind, you might say this is what people say. These are their conceptions of people who have a science degree or a non-science degree and if they're men or women, so different views of, of what those people are. And I've kind of summarised what they've said. So that, that's another important point here in these kind of tables. Very often you don't include the whole text, but you include kind of some kind of summary. Now, obviously, on a table like this, it's quite small. I haven't got much space, so I have to summarise a lot. This is why you might want to use the wall to do it, because you have lots of text. And, and, and you know, little post-it notes, things like this with text on, you can pin up and, or stick up. Um, it doesn't have to be quite so large as this, um, so you can get more text in, but still you're probably fine you want to summarise because there's a lot to be put into to one cell. But of course that summarising process itself is part of the, the process of analysis of thinking about what we're doing. So what you can see from this very so quickly is that you know, a science degree has a certain perception, um, whether it's male or female. Um, you know, these are kind of clever, appears twice, um, you know, um, numerate, um, and um, numerate appears there again. So whether it's male or female, it's the same view. You might say, actually, I'll make this up, so this is probably my conception of <laughs> what it means, what it means. But uh, whereas non-science, you know, it's seen artistic and arty and so on for both male and female. But again, differences between men and women as well coming up here. So you can compare across runs like that to say, here's the, the view of a science degree whether they're male or female. Here's the view of a non-science degree, and this is nothing terribly world shattering here. But also you can compare it the other way around. So you can compare, you know, across the different rows to see how females you know, seem differently from males. But even more interestingly, different cells. So there are female scientists seen differently from male scientists in a different way than female art students are seen from male art students. I think you can see there's some hint of that's going on here. That, you know, the, 
women are seen as more individualistic, dogmatic, and so on, masculine. That's not a term that you obviously use about the men. Um, whereas the, the non science degree females are not seen as, they're seen as traditional, uh, and so on, in, in some kind of contrast. So you can begin to make those kinds of distinctions. And now, there's nothing deep about this. This is very simplistic. The reason for doing this is to show how you make those comparisons. Row against row, uh, sorry, row against row, column against column, and then within rows, cells, and look for you might call what you might call interactions. So you're looking for the way in which the perceptions of science degree interacts with the gender of the person who is doing the degree, uh, and interacts in a different way with them when they have a science degree from the way it interacts when, when they have a non-science degree. So you can look for the interactions as well. And that, I think, is the, the, for me, the core of laying things out on the table that way. You can look for those comparisons and contrasts across rows and columns, and for the interaction effects within rows and columns. So here's, here's a more realistic one. This is actually back to a study I think I've mentioned before, uh, which is um, some of my PhD students here some years ago now, looking at a couple of small high technology companies in, in the Yorkshire area. And what it's doing here is comparing two different departments in the two companies, marketing department, production department, in BizComp, or sorry, CompBiz and CodeCo, which are made up numbers. And here's some quotations for what they were talking about. You begin to get a picture if you read it through in detail that there are a lot of differences between these two companies. That, that um, you know, in, in one there's, um, you know, you get differences between, well, this is clearly a high turnover company in both senses, but it's not quite so, um, so clear in, in the code co I think, company. That's an um, issue. So the turnover is there, it wasn't there. So you can see you begin, these are kind of summaries of, of quotations from respondents in this study. So that's a very simple, you might say attribute kind of contribution. Um, so these are actually different, different um, cases by attributes, or by you know, different aspects of, of the, the company. As I said before, you can put other things into the rows and columns, and codes is one of those things. Um, so you might, in this case, I have a suggestion of job search strategies. So I've coded the, the, the information in the interviews with job seekers about how they looked for work. And then, of course, I had an attribute of gender, so some of them male, some of them female. I can compare those two things in that table. Again, using summaries of what they sent. And this is what I got there. Now, I coded their um, strategies into three major approaches, what I call routine approaches, which is on the left-hand side, um, and then haphazard approaches, and finally entrepreneurial approaches to looking for jobs. And then I put in some typical quotes about you know, where people were talking about their search strategies, um, either as males or females in here. And well, for, obviously what you can do here is begin to contrast. I mean, one particular obvious thing to do here is compare male and female. You know, what do female taking a kind of fairly routine approach looking for jobs compare with males talk about? Um, and you can see one thing that quite clearly comes up is childcare requirements and some things like that, which obviously the men don't mention. And um, that's kind of a summary of things over the several respondents. Um, there were, I think, something like 30 or 40 people in the study altogether. So typically you might not have a much bigger table with many more people appearing to get kind of... But still, perhaps have typical quotes or get, perhaps even indicate yourself that this was a typical quote and it represents more than one person. You could do that. I've kept it fairly simple here in terms of number of people. And you can also compare across rows by looking down here the entrepreneurial approach. Um, so these are you know, much more kind of enterprising ways in which they go out and look, you know, set up jobs and keep contact going and so on. In the middle, these haphazard ones who kind of sometimes look, sometimes don't look and so on. Um, at, at, uh, um, you know, Dave obviously prefers his goal, he's a really serious <laughs> looking for work. Um, and so on. So no clear pattern of... of, of. Now, of course, the, the interesting thing about laying things out as well, I'd already got, in a sense, these different approaches. But when you begin to look at the quotations, you begin to think of other things. And I think there's another use for this on tables. Is you start to think, well, actually, maybe there's things here. Ah, well, you know, this guy is gardening. This guy is, you know, looking at certain kinds of things certain days. 
Here, there's a much more kind of routine fashion. Now, what might occur to you then is that, well, actually, is this something that people start like this? Maybe they do this for the first few months, then they get disenchanted and they, they transfer into the haphazard. So they might go back to look at the individuals and say, well, okay, well, how long have these particular people been unemployed? And then see if there's a pattern there. So is there a, a transition from one to the other, perhaps? Or is it just simply different kinds of people, that some people do this and some people do that, and they stay like that throughout the whole period of unemployment? And the onset of the entrepreneurial so, yeah. is there something that makes people go entrepreneurial at some point or not? So the usefulness of this is, is not just to see the patterns and the relationships, but also perhaps to lead on to other kinds of questions that you might then investigate. Okay, okay some more examples of uh, tables here. Um, cases by codes. Um, well, in, in this case, with the previous one, I should say, this, this one here, remember I'm looking at here at, at codes versus attributes, not cases. Cases appear individually, here are their names. Um, these are obviously pseudonyms of the people in that study. Um, so the cases appear, but they don't appear as columns, whereas you can have a whole case on the uh, screen. Um, and that's what I've suggested in this next table. If you want to look at differences either across codes or case by case comparisons. So here's that one. Um, in this case, I've got three people, the same study of unemployment Harry, Pauline, and June. And I'm looking at them comparing work background, their vacancy searching accounts, how they talk about looking for work, and where they're looking, where they're, how they're doing it, what kind of breadth of things. So, here you've got, now this, this is very much like the um, Richard Lewis approach, the, the framework approach, but they tend to do it case by case and then have lots of columns for different kinds of codes. So this is a typical kind of approach from them to do it. And you begin to establish patterns. Now, there are various things you can do here. Um, if, you, if you do this in a word processor, I mean this was done in Word, the original, if you do it in the word process, okay, you might only have a small screen to scroll backwards and forwards across the table, but you, you can make, make the table very big and make the page very big and get lots of stuff in there. Or make the font very small and have to enlarge it to see what's there. But the important extra bit you get from doing it in the word processor is that you can then sort things. So in Word, you can sort the rows in the table. And what you might do is begin to classify these in some way. So you might say, well, Harry, his vacancy search account has a certain type. So you actually begin to classify the answers you get here and say there may be two or three types of response here, two or three kinds of different accounts. Set up a new column which labels them, these accounts, and then you can go back to the word processor and sort them and get all those accounts that are similar all together on, on the screen. And then you can look, then you can compare rows and well, okay, they have the same accounts. Why is that? Did they have the same job? You know, was it the same occupation on their background, or was it where they were looking for jobs that made them give similar accounts, or was it something else? Again, if you've got more columns, you can imagine there might be other things to look at. So that sorting mechanism, that's a shortcut way of doing a kind of retrieval, so they want to get all those people that were doing this this way, and, and see what kind of similarities, how I might explain what's going on there. Or not, you might find there's no commonality at all. But it would be interesting if you did find that you know, they give the same account, because they're all looking in the local area. That's why they do that. And that's what they have in common, most common kind of things. So you can see that tables can be used not just to compare across, but also to kind of begin to reclassify. And that's something else that, if you read Mosley Hibberman, the other book I referred to here, there's a lot of that kind of work in Mosley Hibberman of transforming what is initially qualitative data into some kind of either classifications or even numeric data, putting them into order. Um, and I'll show you a few examples of that in a moment. One quite important sort of, of order is, is time comparisons. And typical here might be you have different codes, type one, type two, type three codes, and then you see what you coded across different time periods. And um, for example, I remember I had uh, a student some years ago who um, was looking at family <coughs> responses to having a seriously ill person in the family. And she went back over three different occasions 
uh, about six months apart, uh, six months to a year apart, to, to look at what they were doing. And I've given an example of that, I think this one here. Um, yes, here we are. This isn't actually her data, but it's very similar to what her data was. So she'd had a, a first interview, second interview, third interview. These might be several months, if not a year apart. And this is talking about pain, man pain management amongst the, the individual who's, who's got some kind of illness and having to take drugs and so on. And you can see how the, the and again I've summarised of course, but you see how the, the views change over time. So at first I'd worry I might run out of painkillers, then the typical comment in the second interview was I tried to avoid taking them because of the side effects. So obviously now we discovered the side effects in the life. And then by the third interview, um, they, they put up with it. They, you know, they, they don't mind being drowsy, it's better than feeling the pain. It might be because the pain's increased and they had to take more or whatever. And you can see the same is true of getting help from relatives, that changes over time, so you can begin to progress through here. Um, and obviously, you know, husband, this is a woman speaking here. Um, so I think it must be the whole case of the woman, yes. Um, that was all the same person. Um, so her husband didn't get on very well to begin with, he couldn't do much to help her, um, he was struggling. Then he took some classes and started cooking properly. Uh, and now she's very reliant on him you know, by, by the, the last stage, so things are going to change. And the independence issue here, yeah, um, she's changed a uh, change of views about that, um, didn't worry about getting help to begin with. Then she finds it frustrating and she gets fed her husband to do things. Um, and then she gets a bit, bit more equipment to help her do things and begin to get a bit more independent herself. And you can see there's maybe a contrast in it. So, well, okay, she's independent in what she says here, but then she's less independent or she's more, more dependent because Fred's doing um, a lot more of the cooking and so on. Um, so, you can see there's a kind of contrast coming up. That's another thing, I, you know, you can talk about the progress over time, but also begin to look at whether there are different patterns over time. Not everything changes the same kind of way. And this is another way of expecting the, the data to see that. Now, this, I mentioned this just now, that we can go into um, you know, reclassifying, counting, um, giving ideas about degrees or, or um, uh, the amount of something or whatever. Um, so we begin to get towards kind of some kind of numeric kind of reclassification of codes. And the first thing we can do, and this, this perhaps comes about, I have to mention this because this is the kind of thing you do in Vivo and in other software packages, you can very often get numeric counts. And so in Vivo, you might have seen it when we looked at the software the other week, that very quickly if you do a table, or a matrix it's called, matrix search, uh, you can actually very quickly get numbers in the cells. In fact, by default, you start with numbers in the cells. And there's even a, a shading system that shows you how big those numbers are, the darker the shading, the more the numbers and so on. And those numbers are the number of people, quote, you know, number of persons, number of cases mentioned, the number of times the coding happens, the number of words coded, and so on. So, and all of those things might be some kind of measure of salience or importance. But you have to use your judgment about that. It's not always the case. Just because somebody talks a lot about something doesn't mean it's more important or more relevant or whatever. It just might mean they're very, very talkative. They're very loquacious. Um, it might not mean anything other than that. But nonetheless, there are you know, some indications. If, and if another thing is if, if you know, a, a large proportion of respondents talk about that topic, that it's in itself means it's significant to a large number of people, but is it more important simply because of that? Well, it might be, and maybe a good reason for the it is, because the majority talk about it. But don't forget that the others who didn't talk about it, they might have different things to say, and so on. even minority viewpoints might be interesting as well. So you can't just simply focus in on the, the high numbers. It's like, there's a real danger of that. Yeah, but nonetheless, they can produce some interesting things. But you go kind of further than that, you can do this recategorization and actually start to, to create numbers from data where they weren't at the beginning with. So you're not actually measuring the number of words or the number of times it's coded, things like that. You're either looking at what the codes mean and you're saying, in some way, I could begin to reclassify or recode them in some way. And I've given some examples here, you know, high or low, or good, middle, and bad, and so on. Or there's some kind of, of range of results of something that you might want to spread them out on. And you might, might, you might want to measure them. You might want to put them on some kind of scale from 1 to 10, for example. You might be able to feel able to do that, or simply put them in order. 
um, you know, first, second, third, fourth, and so on, without any kind of measurement at all, just simply ordering them. Or it might be something very simple, that it's good or bad, just classification of two kinds of things. Now, not all codes are, are you know, really kind of suitable for that, but, but some are. And um, you can actually, um, I, I perhaps I should mention that this the grounded theory point. This, I think I mentioned this in the previous week, that um, in grounded theory, they have this idea of, um, of taking a code, uh, and within a code, you might have various versions of it, various ways of doing something, or various ways of being something, or various ways of, of or various places of doing things, and so on. Um, so there's this idea of dimensionality. A code can have dimensions. That it can be about this, but it can be about this particular aspect of it, or this particular and so on. Um, I mean, it's very, you know, life is full of these things. I mean, you know, um, traveling, okay. People travel to work, but they travel in different ways. Some walk, some take a train, some take a bus, some cycle, some walk and take a train, and so on. So you can have various dimensions of travel to work. Now, one way of thinking about that is you might say, well, okay, if we're talking about travel to work, perhaps we can measure it in terms of how long people take. They take a, you know, more than an hour, more than half an hour, less than half an hour, something like that. A very, you know, broad kind of brush kind of approach. You might then classify them in this kind of way of long, middle and, and short travel, something of that kind. Or it might be that um, you're more interested in, in how much it costs. So you measure you know, the cost of their travel and, and, and that's high cost and, and low cost perhaps, something like that, or free if they're walking or cycling and have to, have to pay. So there may be fair costs. So just a division to two things you can do. So that's what this is about. And, and Miles Jibman talk about this and take it a bit further, talk about some indices so that you actually begin to, to, to kind of add up these numbers in some way to produce these kind of measures. Um, I've said this about so you can work process to all the lines. But here's some examples of what, what they, they, they produce. This is one from Martin Huberman, quite a complex table, which is why I did the printout partly, so you can see what's on there. Lots of X's, and X's you can see from the thing at the bottom means simply the change was claimed unambiguously by separate informants. So, if I'm right about this, I think these are schools or school districts. Um, so these are down the left hand side are names of places, like Seeper and Plummet and, and Batonstown and so on. And then they interview people in these places, the teachers and the administrators and so on about it. And so if they got several people that said, we've changed, um, and there's no ambiguity about it, then it's an X. So it's a lot of change on top. If the change was only mentioned by one person, then it's in brackets, so it's slightly less of an of a end where it was a change. And then if other things went on, like um, the, uh, there was initial change and reversal, you've got an X hyphen zero, um, which are you know, one, two, you know, Dunn Hollow and Proville areas were doing that. Um, so you begin to get a kind of image of these. You can see there's also some missing stuff here. There's no information about these, so nobody mentioned it at all. I didn't have no evidence of what's going on. And they've also classified down here, given some idea. This is generally the basis of reading what they've got, or at least listening to what they heard from respondents about how big the change was, what's the magnitude of the change. There's a, high, a lot of change going on here. And you can see they actually reordered this table in this order. So the, the, the places where there was a lot of change going on are at the top, hence the, the sorting out into order. And those that were low or none are at the bottom here. And you begin to see a pattern going on here that you know, there are lots of unambiguous changes going on up here. That, you know, that, that you might expect a lot of, lot of change going on. Um, and here, less, less clear cut change. But the important thing is, to, of course, then to start looking across here, the different rows. Now, I don't know what these mean, these things. I'm not to read the text. I think they do explain it in the book, what daily routines, repertoire, relationships mean. But I presume these are the different kinds of changes, hence back to the ground theory idea of dimensions, different kinds of ways in which the, what was going on in the schools, the teaching, the administration, so on, was changing. Um, and they classified those. And I think the image you get from this is there is, to some extent, you know, what you can see, the major changes in all schools were in daily routines and repertoire. 
But you're also going to be beginning to the, the suggestion that you know, if you look at the, the moderate to low to, to no change areas, there was no change in these areas at all, or very little evidence. Whereas here it did kind of spread outwards. So if they changed some things, they changed others. That kind of suggestion you can come from here. So again, another way of trying to identify patterns in, in what you've got. And another Miles and Hibbman table, this one, uh, which is on page 199 of the book. Um, I can't know this one because it then represents the chart. Um, again, they, they've classified into order in some sense. So they've got two dimensions here. The pressure to adopt um, different kind of methods. This is the relationship of pressure to adopt and degree of attitude given to users of 12 sites. So there are 12 places they investigated this. Um, back to the same, the same town, the same uh, area to the town. And across two dimensions, the pressure to adopt and how much latitude they had as, a, as, a, in, in, as an institution to change. Because they change a lot or a little and so on. And they try to measure that. And then they put each score on the chart, roughly speaking, where they think it should be. Now they haven't measured these, there are no accurate measures. These are reconstructions from their qualitative data. So they've kind of estimated that here Astoria is a place where they had a lot of pressure to adopt the systems and a reasonably high latitude. And, you know, they have the ability to, 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 to move things in that direction. Whereas um, Masipa had equally high pressure to adopt but didn't have the latitude, didn't have the ability to the, the, the wherewithal to, to, to make those changes. And the other last nice thing about this table, or this particular scattergram, scatter plot, is that they put on a time dimension too, so that you can see those places that have changed from one to the other. As do you get a key value to do this? <laughs> well, you need to change, if you haven't got the, change, you haven't got the information across the per time period, you can't do it anyway. But they obviously had, um, so that they can, they can put it on. But I think it's quite nice, you can see here, you know, the ones that changed a lot in, in their opinion, based on their data. I think it's just when you think you do about your own conjecture. Yeah. You try and think, oh, would you put into something like that? Or that person should be an institute. That, I think, yeah. bear in mind, I think this was quite a large scale project. We're talking yeah. about 12 different authorities with, with yeah. schools and so on in them. This must have been a, a large scale project with many mm -hmm. researchers working on it. Yeah. I don't think PhD research is the kind of thing we're talking about here. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, yeah, I think that's right. You just wouldn't have enough information to make this kind of judgment. Yeah. But on a larger scale project, you can see them going through this table, giving a report back to the, the funders yeah. of the project. You know, this is what happened. Look, this is what very nice and neat thing. They can actually say, look, you know, some schools stand here. They really did yeah. respond. I mean, they, you know, they 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 moved from from that to that. They changed the way they did things. They, you know, they had a lower latitude to begin with, but they reorganised themselves and they had the ability to change quite rapidly the, the next time we looked at them. So, so we can see they were they were a good school. Or uh, this one, you know. Um, Carlson, um, to begin with, there wasn't very much pressure on them, but then things changed. There was a change of local authority, new educational governors were appointed, and, and suddenly the pressure was on them to, to change, and so they, you know, that's what happened. Yeah. They got their act together. Sorry? They got their act together. Got their act together, yeah. Okay, we, anyway, whether that's the case or not, I don't know. But we don't know the time difference. It's right. But you can see the kind of way it can be yeah. used. Yeah. Here's what I did. Um, this was, I mean, it's not a full study again. This is back to the work, looking for work project. And here I classified where people were looking. Remember, I talked about this in the previous the slide. Whether they're looking locally, regionally, so this would be, you know, just in Kirtleys. Region would be Yorkshire area or possibly across to Manchester. Nationally, looking anywhere in the country. And so I divided that in turn that Mary and Jim were looking nationally, and Sharon, June, and John were looking regionally, and so on. And then I looked at how many services they said, they were actually one of the set of questions they were asked, and they went through a whole list of things, do you use this service, this service, and so on. So we can actually tell, just a simple number, how many services we used, and classify them for, for that. <coughs> you can see Ahmed used you know, three services, and this group down here, Andy, Harry, Dave, Tom, and Susan used no local services. And then, this is the, this is the creative bit, we put circles around things, we became kind of groupings. Now, 
this is where there's a lot of, lot of judgment comes into this. I mean, and of course, I cheated slightly on this particular diagram by leaving people out and so on, um, just, just for the purposes of showing mm -hmm. what's going on here. But you have to justify. I think I could justify that. You know, they're in the same place. But these here, I don't know. Was that, is that two groups or, or is it one group? Mm -hmm. What you can see is at the beginning, it looks like there's a clear group here with one group of people. B, group B, were all kind of didn't use any services, only looked locally. Mm -hmm. And what I do then, I look back and say, well, what's their biography like? What kind of people are these? And I wouldn't be at all surprised to find these are older people in working class, or were in working class employment, so they're in you know, manual type jobs. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I, I expect Mary and Jim to be professionals, because they're looking national, mm -hmm. partly. That's, um, but all, as it happens, they're using a you know, reasonable number of services as well. The others I don't know about. Um, so you know, this is where you know, interesting group is here, C. I don't know. But the, you know, laying it out so it begins to help you to kind of group things together. And it may only be a means to an end. And you know, the table itself isn't what you're going to show. But beginning to lay things out this way helps you kind of group things in ways that might lead to interesting questions or interesting explanations. OK, so that's uh, scattergrams and the like. Um, let me now look at the maps in general, or charts of different kinds. Um, these are ones where you kind of build up very often models um, of things, so that um, you want items on the chart or the diagram to indicate different things. So very often you have a, a concept or an idea which is surrounded by a shape of some kind, of the, the, um, the uh, ellipse in this case, and then you link them in some way with a line, possibly with a name on it, possibly with an arrow head if there's a direction of, of movement of some kind between them or causation between them. And even other things like putting plus and minus signs on whether it's positive or negative or balanced relationship, etc. So there's lots of different things you can do in diagrams. So let's have a look at some of those. Let's start with what's called the event state network. And again, I went back to the, um, the unemployed um, study again to get these. There were various events that they talked about, things that happened to them that in their biography, so to speak, where they obviously quit their job or they were made redundant, uh, or the short-term contract came to an end, or they left school or college, or they had an interview, or they took careers of life, they went and took some training, and so on. So lots of things that happened to them. And then between those, there were states they were in. So they were, they were unemployed, they were just doing this routine searching every day, using entrepreneurial searching, as it turns out earlier on that we developed, looking for work. <coughs> Include this idea of half looking for work. Um, I guess that's looking for work, but not terribly seriously. So mm -hmm. Doing it some of the time and not other time, not bothering, or, you know, doing it some days, not other days, that kind of thing. Um, and you can arrange these in a kind of a diagram, which I've done on the next page, to show how those things will relate. And I've kept the same colours, so that the yellow indicates the, the events, and the bluish um, indicates the, the, the states. So states are in, in uh, ellipses, and uh, the, the rectangles are, are the events. And I've also on this diagram indicated a direction of movement, so a flow of people from one event through a state to another event by the arrows. So people go from redundancy to become unemployed, and then some of them start looking for work, and some of them get an interview, and some get a job offer, and some of them in work. Now some drop off, and you know, clearly very few people get interviews, but not all of them get a job offer. Perhaps you would extend the diagram by saying they go back to looking for work, perhaps they should have continued a curve down around there. Um, I have to admit, one reason I didn't do that was because in this particular diagram I was trying to illustrate how you could do things in any Vivo version 2. In Vivo version 2 didn't have bent lines, <laughs> no curved lines, so I just left it out. I thought this was an interesting diagram as well. The second thing you might notice is that the lines themselves are different thicknesses. And I did that to indicate how many people in this study did make this transition. So how many people went from redundancy to being unemployed compared to these others? And you can see a lot of people in the study were redundant, maybe redundant, rather than anything else. Um, and then, you know, how many went from careers of life to looking for work? Well, yes, quite a lot of them that went through that particular transition. And down here, once they got the job offer, most of them took it up and went to work. 
Very few people turn them down. So you can, you can feed in quite a lot of things in the diagram, which can be partly a constructive activity, so you're, you're still thinking through the data and how you arrange it. But also you can see that there's, there's a model being built up here of how people move through the various events and states that they're in. And you might say, you know, begin to look at it and say, well, actually, what's going on here? And maybe we need to think carefully about, well, the half looking for work group just simply sit in the middle and going nowhere. What, and I, I'd be on wanting to ask, what happened to them? You know, did they carry on getting nowhere at all? Should they perhaps be pushed back into training or you know, more career advice or something like that? Um, and you, you know, so you can begin to use it around and talk about other kinds of almost hypotheses that you might want to, to um, follow through on data. Have you heard of Venn diagrams? Yeah. Yeah. Here's, here's one. Mm -hmm. um, these are just simply ways of indicating overlapping characteristics in things. So you know, the, the idea of here's a circle that says born in Yorkshire. So anything inside the, the circle is born in Yorkshire. An individual that were born in Yorkshire can't appear outside the circle. Here's a circle for intelligent people. Okay. Sorry? I'm outside the circle. <laughs> what, born in Yorkshire? Yes, I was born yeah. in <laughs> so you, you can't be in a diagram at all then? No. No. I'm not in a diagram at all. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to hold that. No. Well, yes, you can. You can be, because you can be around here. You can be oh, good right. looking oh, right. and intelligent. Yeah. And good right. looking yeah. and intelligent um, and not being yeah. Yorkshire. So then you're, right. you're in here. But there is a group here mm -hmm. who are born in Yorkshire, intelligent and good looking. <laughs> 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 That's, that's what that's what I mean, that's probably illustrate yeah. what, what the Venn diagram does. That's a very simple yeah. idea. And again, that's again a useful way of laying out sometimes of laying out your data, showing what you've got. And maybe of even asking questions like, well actually, why didn't I get anyone in this state? You know, I've got Bobby Yorkshire, I've got good looking at him, but I didn't get any of these in my study. What's going on? Um, what happened? So a, a Venn diagram is a good way of kind of identifying puzzles and permissions and, and gaps in the data. Are always three? No, no. Even Any number you like. It just gets more complicated yeah. to show them all. But sometimes that, that's real life. I mean, if I go back to that, um, there might be another kind of category here, and that might be, um, let me think. Um, it's got a degree. Well, you might expect that to overlap with intelligent, mm -hmm. and perhaps born in Yorkshire, but not so much the good. And there might be, it might just overlap with good looking. So maybe it comes here, mm -hmm. like that. In which case, it's quite clear you've got, you know, intelligent with degree, mm -hmm. born in Yorkshire with degree, but they're not very good looking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know, people with degrees are all, you know, mm -hmm. ugly. That's what it's saying. Now, of course, I've just, I've just made that up. That's not, that's not real life. But, but you asked me a question, yes, you can have other, other mm -hmm. categories on here. And the way they're arranged, you know, you might have that here, like that. In which case, you could say, you know, you're going to get all sorts of categories. But it might not, and that becomes interesting if it doesn't overlap in that kind of way. It overlaps, overlaps here. You've then got to, you can say, oh, I've got lots of people with degrees, but none of them are good looking. What's going on here? Does our admissions progress, mm -hmm. process, you know, reject good looking people? I, okay, that's, that's yes. frivolous, I know. But that's the kind of question that, that a Venn diagram might lead you to ask, if, if that's what you discover. Okay, another form of chart you can use here, the flow chart. Um, actually, I've already used these. Um, the lecture I did some time ago on analytic induction, I used a, a chart there to show you the, the iterative process. That was a flow chart, and I went round, and you can see how you moved round it in various ways, and eventually escaped out because you got the final analysis done. And that's what a flow chart is. A flow chart is a flow of things through the chart. You normally start at the top or the top left and you flow through it to various outputs or final stages, exit points or whatever. What flows through it can be a variety of things. It can be people, it can be a logic, it can be you know you do this then that and then that and so on. That's what the analytic induction chart is showing you. So 
a, a logical progression of, of events. But it can be people, it can be a decision. People kind of working their way through to what to do in some point. The, the important point here is there's a flow through the chart. Um, I'll give you an example here. Entry to university, example of a degree. Now, how do we judge whether someone should be offered a place or not? You know, have they got these results? Have they done that? Have they been interviewed? You know, have they got these things? It said, have they got the GSE, GSE, GCSE in mathematics that they need and so on? And if it all comes out that way, then they offer a place is the final result. Or don't offer a place. But you can also show people flowing through the system as well. Um, it's not to be about decision making. And you can use to compare cases. So one case might use a particular kind of chart to show they don't, another might show something different. So here's an example of those. Here's one a flow of people. Um, so this is rather like the event state, sorry, the state event network I showed you earlier on. But in this case, we start with various things. And actually, the numbers in brackets are actually the codes in the original NVivo project. Uh, the numbers of the, the code that, that coded that particular data. So I've got job market, I've got child rearing, left school, conflict at work, I've got company failure. So different reasons why people might enter into the job finding services. These are actually nodes from NVIDIA again, yeah, hence the numbers. And so cruise information service, start that business, adult training, so on. And in this case, the numbers here indicate the number of people. So Lots of very low numbers, hence a you know, study of not many people in it. You might expect a real study of many more numbers there. But one or two, you know, the twos show you these are more, um, sorry, two, um, showing you these are more frequent ways of doing it. And then they end up through this flow. So somebody might start on the job market um, and nothing much happens, they're still unemployed. Five of them. Um, but they might start off with a conflict at work. They come into a training access point and then they uh, go to a career education advice service and then they come down and find a job. So they flow through the system at that point. Here's a different kind of flow chart. This is about making people make a decision. So this, this was a, again from the unemployment study. This is a particular person, Susan, deciding how to pay for a carpet. And she, and this is a longer narrative that I, I represented it as a, a flow chart. Um, just one person in this case, but it's to, to show the idea behind it. Um, now, I should say, for anyone who, who knows about these things, that I've used non-standard symbols here. Many, many years ago, many decades ago, I trained as a, a systems analyst, computer programming kind of thing. And we learned the proper way of doing flowcharts when we're doing system analysis. Decisions are diamonds. But in this software, we didn't have diamonds, so I had to use ellipses. Mm. Things you do, are in boxes, in rectangles. Mm -hmm. And the starting and finishing points, I think, are meant to be um, circles. That's the standard way of doing it. Particularly the, the diamonds for decisions. So if you see that, that's a chart line, that, that's how you do it. But you don't have to stick with those standards if you're not a system analyst. <laughs> but really be, you do your chart any way you like. But, but there is some reason for staying consistent with symbols. So that start and end points, inputs and outputs, might be one particular kind of symbol. Um, states, things you do, might be rectangles, and then something else for the decisions. And notice the decisions always come yes or no, question and then yes or no. So here's, here's Susan trying to, she needs to buy a carpet. Has she got any savings? If yes, she has, she can go out and buy a carpet. But if she hasn't, then she then asks, does the shop give credit? Um, and if the shop does give credit, she can borrow the money and buy the carpet. But if it doesn't, then she's got to go and get money from elsewhere, from money lender. She talks about going to money lenders. Um, and then the question is, can she afford the interest rates from the money lender? And if she can afford them, if she can find somebody not to charge too much, she can buy the carpet. But if she can't afford that, and, and very often she was talking about ending up here, then, you know, does she need the carpet straight away? Yes, then she didn't know what to do. There's no way, you know, that was the conundrum she ended up in. I mean, she didn't need the carpet, she could begin to say that perhaps. So, I mean, a very simple chart, but what's interesting is that example, that kind of use of it also comes up in Miles and Huberman. They have an example of it there. Actually, they give three of these charts. I've only got space for two here. But these are decisions made by American students about whether to, to take out a breakfast contract, and, you know, where they were living, they could take out a contract for. 
So here's different students. This important point about this is that each chart is a different student. And the other one is that they get the doors in the other one. And the, the circles on the lines indicate the path they actually took. So this student asked different questions too. That's the important thing about this, this, this lab. You can begin to represent the different kind of questioning and different kind of arguments that the students have with themselves about what to do. Not everyone goes through the same process. These two students have different process. Different question. Are you used to these records at home? This one asked. This one said, yes, yeah, same question. But then, do you want to sleep late? This one, you know, talked about early classes, didn't talk about that, um, and so on. So, and this one had another question, which we didn't ask at all. Is the contract a waste of money if you don't eat every day? Whereas I spoke, there was a decision that so maybe Nancy you know, didn't eat every day, it was an issue for her. Um, so you can see Nancy ended up saying, yes, she's used to eating breakfast. Um, yes, she, she has early classes every day, so it's worth going out and getting friends. She, she gets the contract. Um, whereas Lucy, um, she um, uh, not used to eating breakfast at home. Um, she wants to sleep late when she can. Um, she thinks the things are a waste of money, so she'll buy the contract. So there's a decision process going on there. So again, a, a very simple flow chart to illustrate that. Another kind of a version of flowchart is a causal chart. So it's, it's not really a flowchart because there's no flow here. The links, though, look like a flowchart, but they are indicating causal connections, one thing causing another. Um, and here's an example again from Miles and Huberman of that, um, where the, each item is causing another. There's some kind of influence or relationship. And they've indicated that by using different lines here. So the, the, the single line of the single arrowhead is a strong influence, the dotted line a weak influence. And the line with the arrowhead both end. I don't think actually there aren't any on this diagram. It's strange, there must be some other diagrams ahead as well. Um, we indicate reciprocal. But in this case, it's all one way of causation, and some are stronger than others. So you can see relational changes had a strong influence on quite to change, but a very weak influence on role construct changes. Now, again, to get this, you have to, this is a kind of summary of a much, much larger data set. You need to go through and look at all the kind of relationships here. But the sheer task of laying out the table itself does not clarify things. You have, you have to construct these boxes to begin with. These might be codes, but they might not be, so you have to do some processing to get the boxes. Then you have to lay them out, to think about these relationships. And each of this is asking you a question. Okay, is this a strong relationship? Go back to the data, look at it, look at what people are saying, one thing following another. In which case you can say, yes, it's strong, or no, it's not strong. And you can see this kind of table encompasses enormous amounts of work and to produce it. It also goes across time. And you can see here T1, T2, T3, so early implementations of things here, uh, middling ones here, and these are late implementation issues. So we managed to do that type of classification as well. So uh, quite a lot in, in that table. And I think this is the last one I want to show now, an organisational chart, where again you have arrows, but they're not decisions, it's not a, a flow chart or such, but there might be a flow of other things going on. But they're quite useful for, particularly for organisations, talking about you know, the complexity of organisations, how they work, and a diagram often helps clarify what's going on. And I was particularly taken by that, because actually I did that when I was head of department some years ago. In the school, we had a reorganisation of how we organised the school. And myself and a colleague, you know, Dallas, uh, constructed this table. He drew one, and I redid it in the form you're about to see, to show what's going on. And I thought, you know, the process of actually doing it helped to clarify for all of us what was going on. And here's that diagram um, in colour, on the original. And what we had was two kinds of lines. Um, the, the black arrows were direct reporting, so that, for example, the research centres reported to the research committee, and that itself, through the, the chair of that committee, reported to the school board and the school management team. And, and that way. So directly, you know, the individuals would appear at meetings and then report on what had happened to them in that particular scenario. In addition, there was information flow that went both ways, so that the uh, research centres would send the information off to the planning resource committee, and off to the departments and so on, and the other way around, the departments would tell them, and so information would flow around the whole system. 
Um, and that's kind of where we begin to we, we could begin to see, you know, who was responsible for what and who had to report. You know, obviously the school board was the final arbiter of things, but the school management team acted for the school board for most of the time. You know, in between the, the board meetings, which were about three or four a year, um, and the departments too had autonomy to certain certain things um, to run things. Um, but this was this this kind of leaves out large amounts of the school. I have to say one thing. For example, you see the departments, but they, they don't have anything. But in fact, they do. All the staff that belong to a department kind of you know, report into the, the department in some way. But we left that off the diagram because we're much more interested in the other kinds of organisational elements that are going on. So there we are. That's an organisational chart. And that's no. Again, if you work in organisations, it's not un, uncommon either these already exist or you develop one and critique it. And you might take this now and say, actually, the school now doesn't work like this anymore. It's, it's changed. In some ways, hardly at all. In other ways, quite radically. So you might take this and begin to investigate those changes and what it means for what's happening in the school. Um, 